Preparing to delve in three, two, one. Okay, which direction now? Left. Left, I think left. Then again? Oh, hello listeners, it's me, Nathan. And while I search a creepy dungeon for my keys, let me tell you about BattleBards, makers of fine gaming audio that lets you feel the game and play it. Um, like, like for instance, crawling around a dungeon littered with deadly traps. Almost too real, you know? And as a listener, you can get even more audio for signing up, and I'll, I'll tell you how at the end of the show. Battle Bard's an adventure for your ears. All right, guess I'm going straight ahead. I feel pretty good about... Ah! Oh, I'm going to feel that tomorrow. Oh, oh, my keys! Oh, sweet! Now how do I get out of here? Hello, everybody, and welcome to Delve. My name is Nathan. So, as many of you might know from listening to the show, uh, we have a tendency to talk long with people. Uh, and uh, it's not a bad thing. We enjoy it a lot, and uh, we always like to have uh, longer conversations. A lot of it doesn't make it into uh, the show itself. And uh, such was the case with our recent interview with Dustin DePenning, creator of Synthicide. Uh, you, you heard that episode... Um, and, uh, you know, we had a, a good 30 minutes where we talked about uh, rules writing, but we actually did talk to Dustin for an hour and a half or so, and he had a lot of other things that uh, he was talking about. We were having a good conversation about uh, things in and around the game community and in, uh, in development. Uh, so I wanted to play some of that for you now uh, so that uh, you can reap the benefits of it as well. It more or less starts with me talking about Adventure Zone for reasons, uh, but I hope you enjoy it. I've been listening to, for a thing that I'm going to be doing, uh, they, they said you should listen to Adventure Zone, and they play Dungeons & Dragons on Adventure Zone, and they get into some pretty weird territory too, which I'm like, I don't remember any, I, I don't remember like, oh, I took an elevator, like a space elevator to a moon, I don't remember any of that in Dungeons & Dragons, so apparently it's pretty open. I I can add things in if I really wanted to if if my game master decides that but they didn't they they didn't they didn't do raunchy well no actually they they kind of do is it like super described raunchy though it's not super described raunchy cuz cuz there are the players who want to do stuff like that which is kind of awkward depending on who you are yeah no 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 it's 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 not like that it's uh it's it's mostly the uh the, <laughs> the literal cheese factor of like one of the characters who who he literally named taco <laughs> it's t a a k o and there and it's 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 like the 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 gm if you haven't listened to the show it is it is kind of hilarious i know why they wanted me to listen to it but um <clears throat> it the, the gm is uh, one of the brothers and then his two brothers and his father are the are the three players mm -hmm. and so one of his brothers decided that he's this wizard who's just the stupidest wizard in the world. He's, he's, a, he's a simpleton. He, like, went into the wrong class when he was at wizard school. And his name is Taco. And, but he doesn't know how to make tacos. So there's this whole subplot line that he's trying to get all of the ingredients together so he can actually figure out how to make a taco. So every time they, they say something like, I know this is going to be cheesy, he's like, cheese. Wait, that's another clue. Like, like, <laughs> like, the, like the longer game is, I'm gonna figure out how to make a taco by the end of this and name it after myself. So that's that's like his happy like rule thing for the whole thing. And then they have the uh, like the barbarian character Magnus, who just basically every time they encounter somebody, I attack them. Like just 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 will automatically attack them regardless. And then uh, their father is a dwarf cleric who has um, 1,999 party points. That it, there, there are no party points, but apparently he insisted that he have them. They just they don't know what the hell they're doing. And, uh, yeah. and, and, and Griffin's just sitting there half the time like, oh, you guys, damn 
bastard. <laughs> like, like oh, oh, what was the one I was just listening to? So, something like where they're kind of going, okay, so uh, we're going to take the gauntlet and we're no, no, really don't put the gauntlet on because then Griffin's going to have to rewrite six pages of campaign notes. <laughs> so why don't we not put on the gauntlet? <laughs> Like, that's, like, one of the big things. <laughs> like, okay, don't do that. It sounds fun. Makes me want to play a role-playing game, Alex. You know, I, that... I like comedy. I really do. But at the same time, I, I kind of see way too much just doing things for lulls in a lot of games. Mm. Which isn't necessarily bad, yeah. but sometimes yeah. you're like, I want to play a really cool game with a really cool campaign, and I want to have this awesome stuff going on and make it like kind of like impactful and then you go yeah. and then there's that one guy who everything he does is just for the face roll that would totally be me yeah 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 it would be you i do contend that that if i do there will be logic behind everything i do it okay. might not be it might not be the logic you were hoping i would have but there will be logic behind my actions I want to know what you think about that, Dustin. Do you do you think there's a time and a place for uh, seriousness and then uh, just hilariousness? Or can they coexist together if done well? I mean, you know, it's like movies. You know, what are people in the mood for? And, you know, if you have a group of people that are playing the same game for a long time and don't like switching systems... You know, you're going to be in the mood for different things at different times and you're going to play different ways. You're going to have moments where everyone's being silly and you're going to have moments where everyone's, you know, being serious. And, uh, you know, a lot of us, you know, RPG nerds, we switch it up. Like when, when, when we want to try something new, we try a new game. You know, we don't try to use the same game to, you know, try all these different ways, you know, all these different emotions and stuff like that. But, you know whatever man you know whatever people want is what they want you can't really judge them for it oh i'm this not true. judging just nathan i'm only judging nathan because he makes well, guys that pull grenades out of his pants oh right puffy pants forgot yeah, about him yeah you and back you. on actual writing of rules how many drafts did you have to write before you came up with the final for your rules um like radically different drafts or like you know every time i changed a couple words <laughs> well, I, I tell you, what, I, I imagine that every time you change a couple words, you probably couldn't keep track of that. So just just dramatic changes to the uh, to the content. So I'd say the core player facing rules went through three big rewrites where I completely started over and rewriting them from the beginning. And then after that, there was tons and tons of, you know, word nitpicking. Um, and then certain certain subsystems within this, like I said earlier, the uh, vehicle rules. I wrote like six versions of vehicle rules before I landed on the ones that I liked. You know, it's you don't necessarily write the whole book and then go, oh, that that's good or that's not good. And then, you know, certain parts take longer than others and need to be rewritten more than others. You know, I think uh, when I did my third rewrite, that's when I decided I was going to... Um, try to take all the fluff out of my rules. And mm. that's um, something that some people hate because they think my rules are so dry and so simple. Um, again, you know, it seems boring to them. But to me, I wanted rules that were both easy to read and to reference. So, you know, you're reading it and it's like a manual that's just telling you exactly what you need to know to do what you want to do. And then if you forget a rule and you come back it's easy to find it because you know there's only a couple sentences under the name of that rule and the text is bolded and bulleted and numbered to kind of break the concepts up so you know exactly what you're looking at um so yeah i'd say the the third rewrite was when i started trying to eliminate adverbs trying to simplify sentences um removing story information from the rules and limiting the story information to, like, an introductory page at the beginning of the book and then the back half of the book. You know, because that was a conscious decision that, you know, story is interesting and fun, but story doesn't help you learn the mechanics of the game. Uh, the one way I've seen it presented in a way that I really enjoy 
is uh, the way Warhammer 40k handles rules. Like, if it's an item or a rule or whatever, it'll have a, a short description of what it is. And then after that, it'll have a break in the paragraph, and then it'll tell you the actual functionality of what it does. And I like that because it gives you the fluff, and it just gives you the fluff. But then it gives you the rule in a short little concise manner. So it's like, here's what it is in game, what it sounds like, what it, like an example of what it would be. Or if it's an item, it's a description of the item. And then it's a description of, here are the actual rules that apply to it, what it does. And I like the way it's presented because it doesn't give you just a paragraph or a few sentences that mix the fluff in the actual mechanics of it. It gives you both, but separate. It's fun, because then you can read it, and you go, oh, that's cool, and how does this apply to the game? And if you don't want to read it, what it's like and just see how it applies, and if you're just looking for a reference, you can just go right to there and be like, all right, here it is, I don't need that. This is the rule. Got it. Those, those draft rewrites, were those mostly because you were writing it and it wasn't working, or did any of that come out of, like, playtesting when you realized that that was, that was an issue? Um, playtesting was sort of an overarching overarching um experience throughout that was where you know all the many tweaks came from like you know put this modifier up put this modifier down delete this rule write a new rule to replace it um that happens a lot with player powers where there were player powers i made that i was like you know through play testing no one cares about these powers they're just taking up space in the book delete them um right and then uh or I would discover like, oh, this power is really broken and contributing to, you know, you know, defense in- inflation to where you can have a level 10 character that's literally unhittable. OK, I got to modify that. I got to rewrite it. I got to make it work differently. I would like the second rewrite was probably a result of um, playtesting um, as well. Um, that was where I. uh discovered that I had done a uh, a rollover system where everything was however much you however much you beat the success by was exactly how well you did. So however much you exceeded someone's defense was exactly how much damage you did. Right. Um, which, you know, sounds like a good idea, but it leads to this really weird math situation where at high levels um, you're going to run into situations where people either can deal zero to one damage or can deal 10 to 30 damage, you know, mm. like, um, just cause you know, there's such disparate, um, abilities to, to, you know, to hurt each other. So, um, I switched from a rollover system cause the whole goal as I wanted there to be, you know, you roll the die once and know how well you did based upon what you rolled. And, um, so then I switched and, and redid the system to be instead of, using subtraction which isn't intuitive anyway that's kind of confusing to roll something subtract something and then find out how well you did i instead decided that you're only going to die roll the die one time but you might use that number on the die for multiple things so i switched so i switched from oh if you roll a 10 that meant you that means you roll the highest you could and your attack is X number higher than their defense. So you deal that much damage. I changed from that to you rolled a 10 and that's the highest you can roll for attack. And so hopefully you hit. And if you hit, you're going to add that same result to whatever your damage bonus is. So you use the same die twice. So, um, it changed the math up to where I didn't have to worry about people's attack bonuses being high enough to deal relevant damage because, uh, yes, a 10 still does maximum damage, but it's not because you are, you know, rolling so high over their defense. It's because you're using the same die result as your damage roll. It was, I switched from, you know, subtraction based design, which was trying to have a single die roll describe exactly how well you did, to uh, just being like, okay, I can take this subtraction out of it and still only use a single die, just do it a different way. In terms of, because I, I imagine that the whole system, it takes a while to, to build it. I think we talked about that on the, on the last time you were on the show. But how, what percentage would you say of the time it takes you to actually build the system 
is spent on rule writing? I'd say for me, it was probably 70 to 80 percent of the time. Wow. Um, wow. You know, but I mean, that's including player powers and, equi- sure. and, equi- and equipment rules. Uh, I found, um, you know, the story, the story writing was um, easier. It was easier just to kind of make up a cool story and just talk about the things I wanted to talk about. And then I still hired some people to help out, you know, to give me some more fresher ideas. And then I hired people to read and edit to try to help help make sure that they were, you know, weren't missing any details and they were explained better. But the majority of the time was just uh, designing, testing and wording and rewording rules. I mean, that doesn't totally surprise me uh, j- just because I keep thinking to myself, it's one thing to make a thing. It's a it's another thing entirely to explain the thing. <laughs> and it feels like that that would be like a bigger chunk of your time. Just in general. Yeah. yeah. Um now, uh, Alex, did you ever experience that when you were writing rules? Um, well, I mean, writing the actual rules out. Like, writing mechanics is one thing, because it's just, you have the mechanic. And you just convey how it comes across. But writing the rules on how things work is actually a lot more complex. And yeah, it takes a lot more time. Um, because you can have a mechanic of just how to hit, and you can have that all figured out. Like, let's say... For instance, minus D20 plus your hit modifier minus their evasion score. So that's super simple to convey, which is kind of why we talked about learning things orally. It's easier to say that than it is to write out a description that just, you know, says how you do it. Reading, you have to get across the point in a concise manner that doesn't leave anything out. Because people can't ask you a question if it's written on text, they can't go, what does that mean? And the book goes, well, it means this. It doesn't doesn't work that way unless you have e-readers. So now, the, the one other question I had really on the subject that I made sure to write down, because I'm starting to realize I need to write things down as I go. Um, it's, it's, it's an old reporter habit that I lost somewhere along the line. But um, what have, I'll, I'll ask it to both of you, but I think I'm actually going to ask it to Dustin first. Oh, okay, um, yeah, cause, cause, uh, shut up, Alex. Um, <laughs> that's that's my common refrain. Shut up, Alex. Uh, I'll ask it to Dustin. I'll ask it to you first. But, um, as far as as reading rules goes, what are common mistakes that you've seen as a player of other role playing games? You know, this can be difficult to avoid, but uh, I think reading the rules out of order can be a uh, rookie mistake um and i tend to do it a lot because there's specific things that i want to know in order to wrap my head around a system and get a feel for it and the rules are often not presented in that way like i don't give a shit how you build characters for your system at all um i care like what are the fundamental rules of how a player makes a decision and enacts that decision on the world and then if your game has combat, how does combat work? How do, they, how do players kill each other? Those are like the two things I care about most when learning someone else's game. And um, so I very often read rules out of order because I want to find out, you know, those two things. And because I didn't read them in order, then there, sometimes there's details I miss because the writers specifically introduced a concept in character creation like a rules concept during character creation that is very important to the rules. And since character creation was first, you know, that's where they introduced that really important fundamental rule. But, you know, I skipped over it because I'm like, screw that. I don't care about how I make characters because, you know, unless I, unless, unless I know how to play the game, how do I even know if the character I'm making is good or not? <laughs> you know? Um, so, uh, yeah, like, you know, sometimes it's just hard. You got to, you know, you often have to have the patience to read the rules chronologically, um, even if that's not the way you want to learn them, just so you don't miss, you know, an important rule that um, got tucked away somewhere along the way. Right, right. Because the creator didn't know what they were doing when they put the rules in that order. Screw them. I'm going to the thing I want. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now that you've actually built an RPG yourself, you now know what the problem was with that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but um, I mean, it, it still grinds my gears when character creation is the first thing in a rule book. Like, it drives me crazy. But I read it now. I read it first when it's first. But I don't want to because I'm like, I don't know if this character is good because I don't know how I do cool things yet, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dustin makes a really good point. Re, uh, you know, I hadn't thought of that specifically, the character creation thing at first until you just mentioned that. But now that you mention it, I kind of go, that makes sense. I don't know if I don't know how to play the game, then why would I build a character first? That that doesn't. You're right. That doesn't make sense because you want to learn what you can do and how you do it before you go into making a character who does things. Since you don't know how they do things, for instance, five E, you go, all right. Well, I'm going to make a warlock. What does a warlock do? I don't know. How do they do it? I don't know. Okay. How does spellcasting work? Don't know. It's like the last section in most like D and D books, for instance. Um, oh. What you like spellcasting? Sure. Do you know how it works? No. Yeah, no one does. Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, for like uh, specifically for say like a dungeon master's guide for D and D or a GM guide, those are always kind of tricky with the way they're presented in rules form just because the way they organize it isn't always the way you design an adventure for instance the monster manual for instance in D&D is straightforward it's just an alphabetical assortment of monsters that's super simple and super easy unless you're looking for like how challenging they are but then typically Actually, I think 5e forgot it, but there's usually a glossary of monsters by their challenge rating, and I think 5e forgot that in that book, which is terrible on their part. Bad. Um, they forgot what? Sorry, I lost the, <laughs> the um, like 3.5, the monster manual had a monsters by challenge rating section. Oh yeah, that was how you ran the game. Right, and I think 5e does not have that in their you monster know what manual. Else? You know, you know what else Five E doesn't have? What they don't they don't have all of a monster's powers in its stat block. Really, I hadn't noticed that. I haven't run enough Five E to really. Yeah, like they cross reference abilities and spells and stuff from other books. Yeah, that that is a a games master's nightmare, right there. It's like, why would you do that? You I mean, don't. <laughs> I, I like I think Five E is like a really well designed game, and there's a lot of cool stuff about it. But when I saw that monsters were not super well explained and that all of the powers weren't on the page. I knew that it was not the game for me because I don't want to have to write a research paper to plan a session. I want to be able to open a page, point Mm. to a monster and throw it at the players. Um, (laughs) Like that's what I, you know, everybody likes to take a dump on fourth edition because of how much of a ripoff of world of Warcraft it was. And, you know, how it didn't have any non-combat abilities because everything was a combat ability, you know. But at the end of the day, it was a much more balanced game and it was much easier to run because they had a page with a chart on it that basically said, if you know, this is how difficult a check should be given players' levels. This is how much damage an ability should deal, deal given players' levels. And then all monsters were sorted with, you know, by level in their individual section and then they also had all of their powers in the stat block, so you could just play the game right out of the book. I, As a player, I liked 3rd edition and 5th edition much more than 4th edition, but as a game master, I will never run 3rd edition or 5th edition, because hmm. it's just too much prep time. I don't, I don't mind 5e. I think it's actually, for players, it's a lot easier to grasp some of the concepts. It's a lot more uh, oh, yeah, the, the, new the player, player friendly. Yeah, the player-facing rules in 5e are excellent. I just don't think they went out of their way to make things easy on the Dungeon Master, and I really fault them for that. So, like, I do play 5e, but I will I will not run it. Yeah. I, I think, mm. to be fair to them, um, most GMs who are playing d and I want to say have more experience with the game in general. Typically. Um, that being said, a newbie trying to learn to DM is going to have a rough time. Well, it's not even that. It's it's the time investment. It's the fact that you read a monster 
entry and it says can cast darkness one a day see darkness spell and you're like i don't even know what darkness does where's darkness this isn't in the monster manual oh it's in the player's handbook under spells yeah no Hmm. definitely uh, some tools for that are really helpful though like um if you are able to have an app or something with spell books you know things like that are always super handy even without necessarily being in the rules but those make gaming so much easier at some times yeah, and that's why I decided to go first party with that. That's why I, I decided that all NPCs in my system would be built via an app, basically an, an app. You know, it's a website, but it kind of works like an app. And all the monster powers would be written out explicitly in that thing. So when you made a few clicks, you knew exactly how that monster was meant to be played. I think if every game had something like that, we'd have vastly superior gaming monsters. <laughs> <laughs> you know the one and, thing while we're speaking of D&D and the rules being weird like that did you ever read the monster creation rules in 3.5 no but I read the monster acid test rules for savage species in 3.0 <laughs> cause the monster creation rules in 3.5 is a mess of just it's, it's if you want to read rules that are poorly written which we don't But if you want to see it, you should check those out. And it kind of describes how to do it in this long two-page thing with another seven or eight pages of templates and bits you can add on and whatnot and powers and just different terms and things. And it's just, I've created monsters with the system before. And I'm looking through this going... This does a really bad job of telling me how I'm actually supposed to do this. Yeah. What um, what I ended up doing was, you know, just because of, you know, trying to make reading the rules easy on me, when I would run D20 games, I got to where I uh, intuitively understood uh, armor class and damage scaling and hit point scaling, and I quit using monster manuals and would just make up my stats on, you know, before the session. So it would be, you know, hard written. So it'd be real stats, but I would just make it up based on what the, what uh, level the players were just so I wouldn't have to sift through, you know, this encyclopedia of cross references to figure out what the hell this monster or enemy I'm throwing at the players does. Yeah, I would be like, okay, they're level 1, so 1d8 damage is pretty good. A plus 1 attack is probably, you know, pretty fair. Okay, you know, like, it was, you know, it just got to where when you intuitively understood the balance of the system, it was much easier to just make up a monster on your own without even reading the rules. It's like, a one time we had our party, and there was a succubus. And it turned out she was super underpowered compared to one of the players that we had in there. Because he was um, moving, so we wanted him to go out on, like, a heroic note. And so he was dealing massive amounts of damage to her. But we wanted the the fight to be thematic and cinematic. So we gave her, like, an extra way too much XP just to prolong the fight. Like, she wasn't hurting him, like, at all. But it made the fight look way more intense. And it's like, okay, we apparently didn't scale this correctly, but it's fine because no one noticed, and it still made them go, oh, shit. Oh, man, I I know some people that would go crazy hearing that story, though, because, I mean, I'm totally okay with, you know, a small amount of illusionism, um, but, you know, because it's a game. At the end of the day, it's a game, and it's a shared story, a shared experience. You're just making up stuff together and having a good time. But there are some people who, like see role-playing games as a form of storytelling chess. And as soon as it's no longer by the rules and it's no longer hard-coded on the paper and you're just making it up, they are all like, you're cheating me, you're fooling me, you're lying to me. <laughs> like, it just drives them crazy, you know? And, you know, everyone, you know, has the right to play however they want, but I, I don't take it that seriously. Yeah, one thing I've done before with, with players that take things by the books is I'll... uh take a monster for instance and they have you know x hit points and as soon as they get to zero i have them not be down because you know some players will know that monster only has 20 hit points therefore it should be dead you know it'll be like no it's got a little extra it's got till it hits negative 10 and then it's actually dead because by the book in like D D, 
In the older game, it was you aren't dead until negative 10. Right, but so, you were unconscious at zero or bleeding out at negative one. Right, so certain monsters would be, like, just still fighting, or they'd have one final attack, and it would really freak them out in character and out of character, and be like, well, you shouldn't be sitting there trying to tell me how much HP he's got. Because yeah. I could have rolled high, I could have rolled low, I could have actually given him bonuses, I could have done stuff. And the other side of that, too, is I've actually adopted something fun occasionally in combat, where, you know, if uh, for D&D, like, specifically around his six seconds, everyone takes their actions in a round. So if you attack somebody and down them, I'll not have them go down until the end of the round. Because if suddenly you attack someone and you all move in the same instance, we're in, you know, everyone's moving at the same time. So that NPC or that monster technically should be able to get their turn before you have killed them. That's interesting. So I have all damage basically resolved at the end of the round. Not like on the character sheets, but you know, mark it down, mark it down. But if anyone goes down, I'll let them finish out the round. And it's like, alright. So you get in a final strike and then, you know, your wound causes you to give in to unconsciousness or whatever. You know, it's really... Uh, a way you can hold the suspense of it, but at the same time, it's also a way to make them uh, need to be aware of their resources. Because if you say waste another spell on a monster that's already gotten down to zero hit points, but you don't know that, it's like, okay, he's dead, and now he's super dead, and I just wasted a spell on it. Crap. Yeah. <laughs> Which can be bad for casters, but at the same time, it's like, well... You didn't know he was dead until you fried him, so... So there. So there. So there. <laughs> so there, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so so the first thing, I have to make a mental note, hashtag storytelling chess. I love that. Because um, that, is, that is kind of what I always thought role-playing games were kind of like. <laughs> it's storytelling <laughs> chess. Um, and I think it was. It, it's also the thing that kind of frightened me as like a novice player that I was going to get into a group of people that are like real pros at this and see it that way. And I would not have fun. So I, I don't know if that's something that you encounter a lot. Um, the, the idea that you have some people that, that do play it like storytelling chess, and then you have people that just don't care. And then they kind of get turned off by it because some people want to play that way, and you're all supposed to be playing together. But that that always uh, worried me. It's kind of like anything, you know, uh, the fandom can turn people off of trying something new because, you know, the barrier to entry is so high. Um, but like, uh, you know, talking about, you know, having different people at the table who want different things, that's where like the indie RPG people got got off on describing this idea called the social contract, which is... You know, you need to all explain to each other what you're trying to get out of the role playing game and agree to those terms. So that way you don't have the storytelling chess people being really angry at the illusionist GM with the narrativist role playing buddy on the side. Like, and, you know, all three of them want something different and they're all fighting with each other and not getting along. You know, but it's, you know, that's one of the things that's so interesting about role playing games is a lot of times they're primarily played by high schoolers, just because yeah. those are the people those are the people who have time to play them. I feel like you need a lot of emotional maturity to play a role playing game. Yeah, yeah, I do not possess that. <laughs> uh, so, if you're playing one to role play, yes. Yeah. So if you're playing one to be a combat simulator, you don't need any. I you still need emotional maturity because you know in party fighting becomes a huge deal. You know, uh, re resource hoarding, basically just being immature, non-team player, you know, I get to do whatever I want. Like, you know, you need to have the maturity to accept that other people at the table are also trying to have a good time. And the way that they want to have a good time might be different than the way you want to have a good time. So you need to work that out. I have definitely had players like this. Uh, I had one player who tried to off another player in character. For in-game reason. And he came to us and said, hey, is this cool? And we go, 
your character has legitimate reasons to want to do this based on events that have happened, so y we don't feel like that's out of character for you, because he was a poisoner. He was a uh, rogue. With, uh. <laughs> he was a drow, poisoner, rogue, and he was slightly evil, and this character had been, like, really an asshole to him. So we're like, yeah, no, that... You know, if you want to try and maim that party member so that the party leaves them behind, that's in character, and it's not an issue by us, because you told us about it, and it's not just a surprise, I'm trying to kill you. And then in-game, when it happened, the other character thought it was, or the other player, rather, thought it was, like, something out-of-game-related, and we're like, no, it's totally in-game. He came to us beforehand, and whatever, but the player would have none yeah. of it, so... We yeah, retconned that's... it in game, but it was like this has nothing to do with out of game stuff. It's totally in game. It's like your character's being a dick to them, and you totally deserved it. But whatever. Yeah, but still, like I would have, you know, that could have been handled, you know, out of game. You know, like hey, your character's being a dick to my character, and I was well, making my character character angry. And you know, what would be fun for me is to either not have that happen or be able to retaliate because those are the two things that make sense to me. So. If you're going to keep acting that way, you know, maybe you should be okay with my character trying to kill yours. Right. They basically essentially blinded them. It's like relationship advice. Just talk to each other. <laughs> but it was definitely Just... interesting. It's like, no, these are all in-game reasons. I, I've told players before, I'm like, I don't mind if you do things against each other in character if it's for in-game reasons. Because people don't always get along. You don't always have a party that gets along you know, 24-7. Sometimes you steal from party members and shit like that happens. Yeah, yeah, but, you know, if there's some people who can't differentiate between the two, like, being having their character violated, even though it's a fictional violation, still really messes with them emotionally and completely ruins their experience just because that's in character for you. Find some other way to enjoy yourself without having to ruin another person's experience. But if, they're, if what they're doing is ruining your experience, then be an adult and talk to them about it. Yeah. That's where the emotional uh, maturity comes in, for sure. So basically what you're saying is role-playing games are a team-building experience. And like dating. <laughs> and like dating, which is also sort of a team-building, well, a two-person team-building experience. Well, it depends on your relationship, Nathan. Okay, well, I'm not going to get into your dating preferences. <laughs> I'm just not going there. But... But that's okay, because I always kind of thought that role-playing games, more than being a game, are sort of like, you know, a social exercise in some ways. Did, have you found that? Oh, yeah. And, um, you know, I even had friends that use role-playing games as a way to practice their social skills, mm. you know, um, because they weren't very social, didn't have a lot of conversations, didn't talk to a lot of people. And they would basically get to see how we would all react to them saying and doing crazy things. The, you know, the socialization aspect of it is intrinsic because you're playing with other people. You know, if it's not a social experience, why even have other people at the table? <laughs> exactly. Cannon fodder. Exactly. Well, that too. <laughs> I, I, just, I just make a new character every five seconds. Yes, I'm just gonna launch my characters into combat. Level ones, go. Hasn't railgun Nathan. That railgun, yeah. I need to get that railgun back. What do you feel about in-game economies such as D and D's, where adventurers typically make uh, tens of hundreds of times the amount of money your common, you know, citizen will ever see in their life? It explains why they're adventurers. It's where the money at, man. <laughs> that's, yep. that's true. But at the same time, it's like, all right, I've got a thousand gold. How much for the town? Yeah. And then the other side of that uh, is just kind of you can give someone a gold. And they're like, holy shit, this is more money than I made in a year. You could ruin economies an entire towns, you know, just their entire structure of being with a few gold. Yeah, I mean, there's no sense of scale in a lot of those games, especially when you deal with the fact that, like, a 20th level character can literally walk into a village and kill everybody and then leave. Without a know. second thought. They just kind of go, yeah. shrug, yeah. dead. You know, they didn't design the system thinking about, you know, scale with a persistent reality. They were just designing a system about, you know, the never-ending treadmill of bigger and better and more expensive and more expensive and they're like well a plus two sword should cost eight thousand gold and they're like yeah but you know 
holy shit, that means we have to give them enough money to get a plus two sword. <laughs> and then suddenly now they have 8,000 gold, which they could use to buy a plus two sword or 50 farms. Plus... Which would probably make enough money to get a sword eventually. Yeah. But, you know, they don't really have a whole lot of rules about that. No. Yeah. Uh, that's a yeah, long game. <laughs> and that's, yeah, that's boring. Yeah. Um, Depends on yeah, your players. They're... It could be fun. I have, I've had players who want to uh, basically build their own town but there aren't really rule sets for it that are really well done. Yeah, wouldn't 8,000 gold, at least in D&D rules, pretty much buy you a town? Or two. A hamlet? Or three. Or just like just like one of the areas of the actual map of the Forgotten Realms? <laughs> I mean, you could just spend it all on the dragon and say, you're gonna do some work for me. That's true. That's a good way to take over the Sword Coast. It really is. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's really Get is. Klaus. Hello, Klaus. How you doing? You want to come down here and use your wands and your breath weapon and just roll over orc armies? Sure. Dragons love gold. They do. That's that. Hey, maybe that's how you balance the economy out. Dragons. You just get you just give your gold to dragons and have them do favors for, you know, you exchange your gold for services rather than items. That's not, that's not how dragons work. The mm. favor a dragon does for gold is not kill you. More or less. Unless you're another dragon that's more powerful than it. You can't, well, like, promise a dragon treasure in exchange for doing something. Because he's like, oh, well, now I know you have this treasure. I'm just going to take it from you. Well, maybe <laughs> maybe I can give the gold to a more powerful dragon to beat up the lesser dragon. Like, again, a, like that a dragon same, bully. Again, that same dragon is going to be like, why <laughs> do I have to go beat up this other dragon? You have the money. I'm just going to take it from you. Maybe I can give the gold to uh, a dragon that's not that I could probably defeat in combat, but if I give it to enough of those dragons, maybe they could gang up on the bigger dragon. Yeah, maybe. I feel like we now need a, a dragon NPC where the dragon is just kind of, like, bored, so he'll do jobs for money. Like, that, that would just be like, wait, isn't that a dragon? Yeah, well, what, what's he doing? Tending the farm. Oh, you eat a sheep. <laughs> dragon mercenary. Just, just it's like dragon do random jobs for you. I mean, I f you figure dragons probably got to get bored, right? They're like cats. You know, they, can sleep as, they sleep as much as they want and they never get tired of it. I mean, I would get bored. I would be like, I, I slept all day. I'm going to go do something. Usually That's they go because you're eat. human. Yeah, I guess. You're not a dragon. So we should, we should mind, we have an NPC that's got his mind swapped to the dragon, so the dragon is sitting there in a humanoid body, and the, the human's mind isn't the dragon. That would actually be really interesting as a, uh, a big bad evil guy. Well, th th I think the human would just do exactly what the dragon would do. They'd get <laughs> bored. They'd start booby-trapping the crap out of their entire, <laughs> their entire lair. They would get aspirations, try to become political. Yeah, they, they vote make me a throne. Yeah. yeah, make me a throne. You're too big to sit on a throne. Make a bigger throne. Meanwhile, you've got the dragon in the human body going, I don't have any money, and I get hungry, and I'm so squishy and weak. And I have to get a job. Now I have to get a job. <laughs> I have to go and, and tend bar at the oh, tavern. Man. I think that would actually be a really interesting uh, player idea for a any kind of humanoid as a player, to say, so I'm actually a dragon in human form, and my mind was swapped by a really powerful wizard or sorcerer or whatever, and so I am literally have the mind of a dragon, so you'd have the super high mental stats, for instance, but then you'd be in a weak, fleshy body, and you'd be like, I want gold, and I'm, you know, you just, like, talk down to people like you're still a dragon, and they're like, what do you think <laughs> yeah. you are? Like, oh shit, right, I'm a human. Yeah. I think I think that gets you into fantasy psych ward. No. <laughs> I think that's what happened. Oh, that... you think you're a dragon? Well, we got a bunch of Napoleons in here as well. Yeah. Run away! Spread my wings. Ah, oh, my wings are gone. Yeah, yeah. I have a feeling that that character would die really quickly. <laughs> or they'd One learn... way or another. <laughs> or they'd learn or to another. adapt. Or they'd learn that maybe adventuring, you get 8,000 gold eventually, and maybe that would be worthwhile. So you make that character's goal to slay a dragon. So he can take his horde. Yep, so he can, if he can't get his mind back, he's going to slay the dragon that did it to him. Totally yeah. going to make this character sometime. Now, I have a question. If he slays the dragon, will, there, will they swap back? 
I hope not. The dragon's going to be dead. Well, yeah, I know, but you know, I get the feeling at that point maybe he's not in a really clear mental state. <laughs> like, like maybe he didn't think this through. Like, like, wouldn't wouldn't you prefer to try and get yourself switched back? Like, couldn't you go see like a a, a shaman or a or a, a wizard or something? I assume that and, this is this is barring the being able to do that. Oh, uh, okay. So you've been cursed, and it's irreversible. There's no yeah. backseats. Yeah, There's no, no backseats. Backs then yeah, uh, uh, screw that guy. Kill that. Kill the dragon. I used to be. Sure. Why not? I feel like this would make a really interesting campaign. Right, right there. Well, that's just a good book title. Kill the dragon I used to be. <laughs> Kill the dragon I used to be. Ten helpful, like, self, self-affirmations. self And now we killed the dragon that I used to know? <laughs> Some dragon that I used to know. Okay. Um, <laughs> I don't know how we went down that road, but... Uh, yeah, what were we even talking about? But... <laughs> I don't remember anymore. Something. I think... We- I don't know. Actually, uh, so, Alex. Yo. I have a question for you. Maybe. Or at least I have a question for you that's actually directed at Dustin. Oh. But I guess we got our brain swapped like that damn dragon. Is there anything that you wanted to ask Dustin while you're making your rules? Why you always got to bring up my game? <laughs> We're not here to talk I- about my game. Oh, maybe, maybe we should. Maybe this should be a game intervention. A game intervention. <laughs> a game intervention. Uh, yeah, yeah. Let's see. Roll for modesty. I'm gonna roll. I'm gonna roll my d20 and see if you answer correctly. No, I mean I don't really think of questions for making my well, game. That that was a bad roll. You should get a better dice. Nine. You should get a better dice. I don't have modifiers for hosting, so I can only use my d20. So you don't have anything that you had trouble with regarding writing rules. Not writing rules like specifically, no. The stuff I have issues with are uh, figuring out how to make my mechanics be the way I want them to. Like, the one that I have issues with now is I want to make a monster generator similar but different to what he's got Nat for, where it's you can build a monster and you build it based on the EXP. So, say it's got dark vision and seven eyes that has an XP component, and then you just add all that together and you figure out what the hell it's worth or how powerful it is. But that's mostly just a figure out what things cost and figure out how many options you want to give things. So I would say, you know, if you're doing this modular approach, try to keep it, um, try to keep choices meaningful and as few as possible. Because when you start compounding less meaningful choices on top of each other, when you could boil it down to just a few meaningful, very meaningful choices, you know, making a few very meaningful choices is more satisfying and a lot easier than making a lot of tiny, not very meaningful choices. Oh, yeah. Mostly the uh, it'll be like charts of, OK, so it's what type of being is it? Is it humanoid? Is it, you know, monster, magical monster? Uh, is it quadruped? Things like that. And then you got like, all right, does it have skin or, you know, does it have hide that, you know, is armored or like chitin? Or, you know, things like that. Or maybe it's got extra arms or extra other things or supernatural abilities. I mean, maybe you could just genericize it to where, you know, you have, what, like four slots for abilities. And the character has one to four special defining abilities. And when you use all four of them, that's like maxed out, you know, on the ability chain. I get you. Potentially. You could do it like that based on the... uh power level you want to create the creature for. Say, a low-level, low-low-low, like, first-level creature could have, like, two to three slots. You know? Or, you know, you pick their their type, and then their, like, size and their race or whatever, and then you choose, like, a couple different things that it may have. So, like, one to three. And then as you build the characters that are more powerful, they can potentially get more slots. Like, your Lich being a 20th level... Lich would have, like, eight or nine different abilities, because liches are freaking powerful. Right. That would actually be a, a really interesting way to approach that, too. And I want to play a lich. No. You cannot play Voldemort. I want to be Voldemort. I want to be that who cannot be named. That way I don't have to think up a character name. Well, to, um, to be fair, 
You don't have to think of a character name. You just have to think of something people can call you. Tom Riddle. Like, like, my, um, assassin, not assassin, my, my monk character for the one shot that you listen to. He has a name. It's Innis. He never gets called by it. Except when he's getting hired. Because ah. he basically always is in uh, disguise as one of his many other personas. He's Roger from American Dad. Right. Yeah, right. No, no one knows the real him. So, But do we ever really know the real him? Nope. That's the way yeah. he likes it. I feel like we had a really tight like 30 minutes right up at the top. And then <laughs> it just kind of went on for a long time afterward. Oh, well. But that's cool. I'm I'm cool with that. So the one thing I want people to take away from that episode, as long as it was, was storytelling chess. That's that's what we can uh, we can call hardcore mechanics heavy role playing games from now on. Is just it's storytelling chess. Perfect. Um, so uh, this episode went on a little while, so I'll keep the outro pretty quick. Um, if you want to find out more information about uh, Dustin DePenning and his RPG Synthesize, which you really should, uh, please go to uh, SynthesizeRPG.com. And when you go there, you can get a much better idea of the world that he built. Uh, the setting, and you can even see some of the generators that he made so that it's easy to make monsters or traps, etc. Uh, which is sort of what he was talking about in, in the episode. And uh, if you want to find more information about us, well, you can go to DelveCast.com uh, and uh, all the new episodes and developer diaries and all of that good stuff is on there. Uh, you can also find us on iTunes. Please rate and review and subscribe when you go. That would be really great. Helps us out tremendously. And you can find us on Twitter. Uh, the show is at Delve Podcast. I am at Citanium, and Alex is at EXP Limited. Uh, we always appreciate getting feedback from people who listen to the show, uh, people who are interested in uh, talking about something on the show, or if you have suggestions. Uh, for subjects that we can discuss on the show, uh, even if it's uh, with developers, because we have a lot of uh, ones that are coming back who have been on the show before, and we're happy to have them back. We will likely have more in the near future as well, uh, as in addition to, of course, some new friends and some new voices that are going to be added to the conversation. Please look forward to that, because we do have some cool stuff that we are planning on doing in the very near future. Uh, foreshadowing. Okay, never mind. Uh, and so, uh, for all of us here in Delve, thank you for listening, and we will see you next time. Goodbye. You have been listening to Mountain, Realm of the Grey Elves in Day, by Angzo Martinez Calvo, available on BattleBards. We thank BattleBards for sponsoring Dell. Go to BattleBards.com, create an account, make your first purchase, and during checkout, use coupon code DELV1 for $10 and $25 packages to get a free track. Delve 2 on $50 and $100 packages to get 5 tracks, or Delve 3 for $150 and $300 packages to get 10 tracks. That's like a full album for free just by using the code. BattleBards.com. Go now. This is where I pipe in that real world physics and abstract role playing games do not mix. Nope. <laughs> but when you have a lot of nerds, they sure as hell try. Oh, yeah. <laughs>